King of Podcasts proudly presents The Broadcasters Podcast, a weekly media commentary talking about traditional and digital media headlines and talking to the content creators out front and behind the scenes. Here is the King of Podcasts. You have made it to episode 114 of the Broadcasters Podcast here. Broadcasterspodcast.com. Thanks for making time to be with me. And because of the fact that hopefully you have the, you know, it's unfortunate you might have the time to go and listen to this program because we might not be as busy as, as we normally are. A lot of things are really making changes here. And just to find things that will keep us busy and preoccupied and take our minds off some of the things that are going on. Now, I must say that this program that really focuses on the media industry is not going to stay away from the coronavirus coverage, but I think we need to go and look at what's going on and, you know, analyze what's actually the advantage being taken care of, being taken advantage of, and the real transfer of our media consumption in this, what I call coronavirus confinement, because I'm sure many of you are confined to your homes, more or less, with limited visits or limited exposure outside to as we all wait to see what happens and see if we can actually see you know a lot of the end of the toll our silver lining that things might be turning around in terms of this pandemic that we're all dealing with right now individually but we're all in this together and i know that for my own self i hope and pray that we are gonna see the light of day after all this and we'll be all right have to be that way but in the meantime you know i'm trying to make the most of it i'm in my man cave working from home for the most part. So I work my full time and I'll continue to consume myself here doing podcasts like I normally do. But now I just have more time to prepare. Have a lot of stories to talk about tonight. We're going to go into. I also have part two of my interview with writer turned filmmaker Brad Holloway. We're going to go and continue that story here on the podcast. But again, so much to talk about. And I'm pretty sure for the next few weeks, we'll continue to go ahead and focus on what's happening here when it comes to all the issues regarding coronavirus and how it affects the media industry, I want you to know that we're going to be here for that. So we'll keep that all here in mind as we go out and we talk about it. So in the meantime, I will also be doing some more content when it comes to the other podcast that I host called When I'm Not Podcasting. A bunch of stories I want to get into as well that I'm going to take some time to talk about now that I have all that time to do this. Especially on the weekends, I hope to go ahead and record some videos, put them out as audio podcasts as well, and have them out there so that we can have some content pretty regularly while the opportunity is in front of us. Um, something I thought we were going to do. So we're going to work on that all coming up now. In the meantime, let's go and get into the broadcasters podcast for this week. So it's no surprise that with all that's happening here, when it's all said and done, we know that what we do ourselves when we are consuming ourselves with content, you know, the way we watch our content, we used to go to the movie theaters, go to a concert, go to a Broadway show, what have you. But then, of course, we always had the comfort of home watching streaming media or listen to music or, you know, if we wanted to go out and entertain ourselves, then we'd also say, okay, we're going to grab some food, we'll probably go grab a bite, grab a drink, maybe a before, after, whatever. Well, those conveniences are gone. Us going out to find a drink, us going out to get some food, us going out to grab some popcorn and go watch a good movie in a theater, well, we don't have that right now. And we're going to have to figure ourselves how we're going to get around all this coming up. But it's going to be... An interesting way, but right now, I mean, digital media, it's fascinating that we have so much available in our, on our fingertips, on all of our devices. And I'm telling you, I can imagine the use of bandwidth right now is more than ever before because people must be streaming media left and right. And I know they are. I follow on Twitter many people. You know, I got about 3,000 followers on my Twitter page and I see what everybody's talking about. They're all streaming or they're all doing things to keep themselves busy at home. So everybody's doing the same thing for the most part, except for a few that are brave souls that are out there working hard for us and helping to you know take care of everyday services that we need, the things that we take for granted, supply chain, when it comes to our groceries, 
comes to our drug stores, when it comes to deliveries, like, yeah, some of you are buying from Uber Eats and Grubhub and getting food come in, or you're going in to go get to-go orders. And we should appreciate all the different conveniences we still have and that we make the most of it. And that's what's very important. Okay, Nielsen Research, the Nielsen Company, they're explaining how COVID-19 could impact media usage across the U.S. This is from TechCrunch. And here's what they said. With U.S. consumers asked to refrain from social gatherings and shelter in place at home due to COVID-19, media consumption is prepared to boom. So the data from prior major crises, crises from recent U.S. history say that forced consumers to stay home, total TV usage increased by 60%. We're not there yet, but consumption, consumption is starting to climb in the most impacted markets. For example, in the Seattle, Tacoma, Washington metro area, which has been hardly, highly affected by the virus, 22% increase in total TV usage. In L.A., 8% opposed at the same time last year. And for some demographics, usage is much higher. Seattle teens home from school had a 104% increase over this period. Total TV usage, to be clear, it includes traditional live TV, DVR recordings, video on demand, streaming services, or other content through any TV set, game console, or connected device. Now, Nielsen's not officially forecasting that the pandemic will increase TV viewing to levels associated with historical crises. But it does note that U.S. consumers officially turn on to the TV during troubling times. Now, here's some interesting things. Prior data suggests that employees who work remotely Monday through Friday watch over three more hours a week per traditional TV. Compared with non-remote workers at 25 hours and two minutes versus 21 hours and 56 minutes. So that's a couple of things just to give you the kind of gamut. Now we want to go and break down a little more about what people are watching and bring that up. So how about the news coverage of the pandemic? What are people watching when it comes to that? Well, the Pew Research Center put out a study. Americans following the COVID-19 news very closely and think media are covering it very or somewhat well. Very well is 51%. Fairly well. 38%. Now, 30% of the people responded, responding to this poll said they think the media have done have covered COVID-19 very well. 40% somewhat. But most think the media have exaggerated the risks. And according to that part, they said that 37% say that the risks have been exaggerated greatly. 25% say slightly. 30% say they've gotten the risks about right. And 6% quite uh, seriously enough or 2% seriously at all. And then about half of these respondents said they have seen at least some made up news about COVID-19 48% of the time. Yep. Yep. Roughly half of U.S. adults are following news about it very closely. And 40% they see at least some made up news about the pandemic. This is a major problem. And I'm not going to go and hamper on this. I talked about this last week. I'm not going to go into it again. The media has to be responsible and accountable. And I'm not going to go into politics. I'm just saying report the fucking stories, please. Don't get into opinion. Quit the pundits and all. Come on. How about social distancing? Leave this alone. Just report it, damn it. That's all you got to do. And that's what's important. The survey was from 8,914 adults. And that was conducted between March 10th and March 16th. So there you go. Now, the consumption on spending or on streaming, excuse me. Let's talk about that. Consumers are now nearly twice as likely to spend more on streaming media. So the idea is social distancing and chill. This is from a morning consult poll. The survey, which was conducted March 6th through March 9th, said that one in 10 adults said they anticipate spending more money on movie and TV streaming services because of the coronavirus pandemic. I imagine it'll be more as they go along. Both of those numbers nearly doubled. Oh, 6% say they would likely spend more on music streaming services. 
they doubled when they checked out March 13th through 16th. A survey found 19% of respondents now predict they'll spend more money on movie and TV streaming. 11% will spend more on music streaming. Very interesting. Millennials and boomers experienced the highest share of growth between the two surveys. In the initial survey, 14% of millennials, 6% of boomers said they would spend more. By March 13th to 16th, 15%. Oh, 25% for millennials, 15% of boomers. How about that? Another thing that's also interesting, TV networks are seeing record high usage. So the four top broadcast networks totaled 18.1 million Nielsen measured viewers looking at primetime live program plus same day for this last week, March 15th. How about that? People are coming back to networks again. So there we go. All right, let's go and move along. And let's talk about the effect the media industry is getting. This is from World Economic Forum. They're talking about empty stadiums and online streaming. So they're mentioning in this story that postponed or canceled events could lead to a decline in revenues for the event organizers, uh, for live event organizers. Cable TV companies are partly dependent upon advertising. So any decline in revenue will impact profitability. So the sports industry, professional sports, are heavily affected now, as we've talked about. So at this moment, the NBA, the NHL, suspended their seasons indefinitely. Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, delayed or suspended for initially two to four weeks. And events on the PGA Tour have been canceled. Europe, many football matches are being played without spectators and leagues are starting to act. The Premier League appears to suspend the season. Serie A in Italy and La Liga has done that in Spain and also other organizations around Europe. We might see major events such as the Euro 2020 UEFA soccer football tournament and the Toronto Olympics and Paralympics will also probably see delays or suspensions. The governor of Tokyo says the Olympic Games will still happen. Some changes might have to be made, though. But should things change, their postponement or cancellation could not could disrupt not only scheduled coverage, but equally advertising arrangements. According to the New York Times in 1980, when the United States boycotted the Moscow Olympics, NBC lost $34 million despite having concerns. Now, this from World Economic Forum is logical. The expectation that restrictions on movement and large gatherings will be in place for some time. That will result in lower spending on media strategies and advertisements targeted at consumers outside their homes. Many countries have introduced limits on social gatherings. Blah, 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 blah. The estimate of the outbreak that it could cost $5 billion to the global film industry. And also, home entertainment, lower entertainment spending, excuse me, outside the home may have knock on effects for brands trying to reach consumer through out of home media like radio and billboards. Emarketer.com did a survey and they talked to respondents from February 2020. U.S. Internet users who are likely to avoid stores if the coronavirus outbreak worsens in the U.S. Most of them are between 67 and 74 percent that say they would avoid shopping centers and malls. And then between 44 and 52 percent would stop, would avoid stores and shops altogether. And there you go. So we're seeing more media consumption. In China, which is now supposedly, reportedly, starting to find the way out of the first wave of the virus outbreak, the country's implemented nationwide isolation measures. Average weekly downloads of apps during the first two weeks of February jumped 40% compared with the average of the whole of 2019, according to the Financial Times. In the same month, Weekly game downloads on Apple devices were up 80% versus the previous year. And Nielsen data during the coronavirus outbreak showed the traditional media also received a boost in the consumption. TV viewership grew after Lunar New Year when normally it experiences a dip. And what a bad situation for traditional TV. For network cable and all television, the chance they can get an audience coming back. And what are they going to do? I mean, would you go and start bringing back shows and rerunning programming that people probably had missed originally and bring it back? Like, what do you do at this point? 
You don't have new programming to go off of. You're going to have to run reruns. What do you do then? What do you do to try to go in and keep that audience engaged? Because you have a chance now. Will they stick around and engage after this is all done? But in the meantime, for the duration, network TV and cable TV need to take advantage of this opportunity. Radio should be doing it as well, but they're not. I mean, people just, I don't think people are really looking at radio as such, but I think there's just chances for things to be done in the television medium. I think there's a good chance. And as for movies, well, the movies are going to have to be made making money on the on-demand route, which is what they're already doing. We talked about that last week. So I guess that's where they're going to go next. Okay. We know advertising is going to take a hit. That's across the board. And for the long term, they say this. It's difficult to say the long term impacts of coronavirus because nobody knows exactly when things will return to normal. The extent of the disruption will likely depend on the type of content that media companies produce and distribute. For the news industry, many companies have used live events as a diversification to offset declines in print revenues. Many of them may not be able to absorb the hit to their bottom lines if large scale events are canceled indefinitely. How will that affect our news diets? Film, TV, and video will maintain output that use media to drive revenues to other parts of their business. will also face disruption. Disney's going to close every one of its theme parks around the world, suspend their cruise lines until the end of March at least, and they're going to probably lose 34% of its revenues from theme parks and 8% from consumers' products. Disney, one of the rare companies that's going to take a hit, would take such a hit of anything else, they're going to take a major hit from this. Sports stadiums, for, uh, sports stadiums forced to close their doors in the long term could use the, lose their allure to broadcasters. Would these competitions be as good or as popular without the live atmosphere that fans create? Because are people going to be acclimated right away to get back out and go to live events, concerts, sporting events? Are people going to want to feel comfortable being in front of that many people? in such an exposed environment. I think that's going to be something that will change. Ultimately, the most important thing for the media and entertainment industry is to help slow down the spread of the virus and help keep people informed about what people should do to stay safe. With these well, with these restrictions, hopefully they'll with luck they'll just be temporary. Beyond this, the industry is in uncharted waters. So with this right here, we're in a different era of this program where we're going to continue to talk about the different cultural, social, economic obstacles, all the different things we always talk about in this program. But another caveat to this program is to how, you know, fighting for the broadcasters, for the content creators, what will content creation be in this new age post-coronavirus? What will it be? We obviously know that the, the era of YouTube, Instagram creators, and those that are creating content, you know, when you don't have, when, when you have to change maybe just the way that you, you know, have a set and you record content in a soundstage or on location, what happens to all this? What happens to the reality shows? What shows, what sporting events, what content becomes ultimately affected permanently? will get a major sea change altogether. We have to consider that question. Because when people are... Rem- Here's the, a couple of things. Number one, if it is a short time that we're in this confinement situation, and if we are only this for a couple of months, say we're up to about si- up to six weeks, eight weeks at the most, and we get a little more normalcy again. Say... By June, yeah, by June, let's say about eight to ten weeks. If we're looking at the first week of June, coming up towards summertime, and the outbreak is still prominent, and we're still confined, and we're still seeing cases come across the board, and and things just continue. We get a second wave, and the flu, regardless of the heat of the summertime, is not going to take this out. I mean... With whatever might happen, what will change us as a society on how we consume our content? How will media entertainment really do? Sports is ultimately going to change. The way we watch, you know, a lot of things are going to change. 
So we have to look at ourselves and say, what's going to happen coming up? Because I think people, I mean, for the long, the, the duration, the length of the duration of this situation will ultimately make people change their habits. Now, I think, of course, there's a few things that are going to be good from this. Obviously, in any live event, sports environment, movie environment, whatever. I think it's pretty safe to say that, you know, more precautions are going to be taken to keep the environments sanitary, clean, kept up. And that it's going to be a safe environment for all. People are going to really work harder to make the experience, I mean, really to win back Win back, you know, fans, ticket holders, fans of all types. Efforts have to be made big time to get things right. And then on top of that, for how long this might last, what what industries might go away as a result? I mean, you know, maybe not go all the way altogether. What what what? Which ones might get an erosion of some sort? Like, what, what could really happen? These are the kind of questions I think that should be seriously pondered right now. Because I think we are in a tough time. And the way we look at things, I mean, I still think there's going to be creative ways for us to be able to go ahead and continue to reach out to the audience. It might be at home. I mean, obviously, the one thing you're going to get is there is a chance to see more people at home. And there are still ways to advertise to these people and there's still ways to market and there's still ways to entertain and inform and educate that doesn't go away and there's still content needs to be done it's we have to go ahead and kind of reinvent the wheel again find new ways to do it obviously what's going to be i think what's going to really stand out i think podcasting is going to get a good jump i think music's going to get a good jump And obviously, people do like working from home. And there are a lot of people that are able to do a lot of work from home. Not going to be for myself. For the last seven and a half half years, I've been doing podcasts here from my home, right here in my bedroom, in my studio here. I've had padding on the walls for the last seven years. Changed my microphone, computers, my setup. Got a green screen setup. I've made myself... You know, my own makeshift audio and video studio. Many other people could do the same thing. And also, some people don't even need to have their own devices. Like, I just read about Conan O'Brien. He's going to, I think he's going to Skype in. And all of his guests are going to Skype in as well. So he's going to keep doing his show as of March 30th. But they're going to do it like a video conference. I might sit in and watch that just to take a look at it. Yeah, we're not going to have, like, the band. Maybe the band will be, like, in their own place. I don't know. But it's fascinating. Right now, I'm watching professional wrestling. I'm a big fan of it. Many of you know I am a podcaster of the wrestling brands. So I, I've i been podcasting about professional wrestling since 2012. Right now, it's one of the few live entertainment products that are out there because everybody else is shut down. World Wrestling Entertainment, WWE, owned by Vince McMahon, and All Elite Wrestling, owned by Tony Khan. Uh, He's one of the co-owners of the Jacksonville Jaguars of the NFL. Vince McMahon, we know, he also owns the the XFL. But these two brands are continuing to produce content. They're still recording and taping and doing live programming from set venues. WWE has their own performance center. And they're able to go and use their facilities to produce content. And they're doing live wrestling shows there. And they're using their archive content to sustain a two, three hour show they have to produce for their networks as part of their deals. Because they have, you know, several quarter million dollar deals each year that they're trying to honor. They don't want to lose that money. They want to lose that revenue. And they know the fans are watching it. And actually, they got a boost as a result. So that's one thing that's got to be said. So you can still see things that are going on. It's just the way it's going to be done. I mean, the way that television has changed, we might see a real change from this. And honestly, this disruption right here, how unfortunate and how climactic it is, I think we're going to see another age of our media consumption. It's going to change dramatically. Are we going to really be consumed into watching programming from people's homes 
and people doing it on their smartphones. Or I mean, how creative could it be? Because the traditional old guard of media is gonna hit it, gonna take a major hit. It's not gonna be same old, same old much. I don't know what it's gonna go through, but that story right there tells me a lot. And that's I'm, again, that's linked in the description here on the page. Take a look at it for yourself, and it's fascinating. I'm curious to see how it'll work out, but it's it is this interesting story when you look at it. I'm fascinated by it. Okay, moving along. Let's go and talk about Hollywood deal makers are dealing. Uh, deal makers are navigating the pandemic and moving amid the looming writers' war. So obviously, the story of the unions and the labor dispute. They're still trying to work things out. So once productions began to shut down, many agents, managers, and lawyers received the influx of calls from their clients, all asking the same question, am I going to get paid? Because now it doesn't matter about the union dispute. Now people are not worried about the packaging fees and the code of conduct at the moment. They're just saying, well, we need to get paid somewhere. We need to keep our gigs. Attorney Jamie Philbin, who works with Steven Soderbergh, and Barry Jenkins says, quote, it now feels like all the time we've been spent talking about the WG and ATA and the potential strike issues, it was just us rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, end quote. So the domino effect of the pandemic is becoming evident. As we know, Hollywood offices have emptied their studios, agencies, and law firms transitioned to remote work. Major events and festivals, including South by Southwest, have been canceled, and dozens of productions here and abroad have been suspended. In legal terms, many consider the global pandemic to be an event of force majeure, an unforeseeable incident that makes fulfilling a contract impossible. This is a strong statement. Town Attorney Lev Ginsburg, he says, quote, this has to be the most devastating example of a true force majeure event Hollywood has ever had. It's unprecedented. Unprecedented, this all. He says we're going to have to figure it out day by day. And everyone seems to have the same principle focus, keeping everyone safe. Even more and more, more before most productions made the decision to delay filming, talent was hesitant to show up to set. In fact, one actress shooting a movie, indie movie, was felt so uncomfortable doing so that she raised concerns with producers but they couldn't call off production because their insurance policy would only cover a shutdown if it was government ordered or an individual on set tested positive for the virus. So once productions began to shut down, are they going to get paid? And the answer is not so simple. This event traditionally gives studios a tremendous amount of latitude to make decisions that they can say were motivated by unforeseeable incidents. During a force majeure, your compensation is typically suspended, and then after that period, which is usually about an eight-week period, the employer can terminate the contract if it doesn't look like it's going to go anywhere. That's according to Linda Lichter, a veteran film attorney. One of her clients is Nikki Carroll, who had her big-budget Disney film Milan pushed back amid the frenzy. She says, quote, if we actually get to this stuff, which God forbid we don't, it's going to be a fucking mess. Now, we had a similar situation during the 2007-2008 strike. The last time there was a major work stoppage. Studios used their augmented power to terminate certain unproductive contracts. And there's already chatter about whether they might do it again. Particularly given the eye-popping overall details of late, we always knew that the Writers Guild strike, should it happen, could be the basis for studios terminating deals, according to attorney Jamie Mandelbaum. Mandelbaum excuse me. He represents several showrunners with overall packs. Quote, perhaps the coronavirus will provide the studios with the same opportunity. And so here's the idea for the actors. Say you're an actor on a TV studio that suspended production before the season can be finished. Do you get paid for the episodes you didn't shoot? Most dealmakers agree studios would not be obligated for paying for episodes that weren't actually filmed because contractually more most actors get paid for all episodes produced as studios normally define that as episodes that are in the can. Now, just because studios aren't obligated necessarily to pay all the creatives doesn't mean they aren't paying. 
A source says that even though Saturday Night Live has called off its next three shows, NBC is committed to compensating its employees for those weeks. Netflix and NBC Universal, both who have postponed production for at least two weeks, are keeping their core crew on the payroll to receive minimum call. That may, however, represent a pay cut for some crew members who are used to working overtime. Should the delays last longer, sources say it's highly unlikely the studios will continue to pay. It may be only a matter of time before those two-week delays turn into indefinite ones, given the severity of the outbreak and expert forecasts. Now, the next six months, another attorney, Craig Emanuel, says the next six months, quote, are going to be a disruptive period for, of time for our industry. And if we assume this, clients, especially actors, will start asking when they can get out of their contracts, end quote. But then he also says, but where the fuck else are they going to find work and remain safe during a pandemic? Are there a bunch of projectors hiring actors on the moon? Very sarcastic there. So others contend the production freeze ultimately works in favor of writers. Quote, one TV scribe says whatever plans, quote, the studios had to rush development and script production before the May deadline are shattered. They need writers working more now more than ever, which weakens their bargaining position. Well, one thing I think that people could definitely be doing if you're a writer, what a time for you to go ahead and, you know, start writing up scripts and screenwriting, you know, whatever project you have. You have all the time in the world. Start doing it. Start working on it, right? I don't know what else you would do. But I think that wouldn't be a bad thing to kind of work on. And as others, if you're in Instagram, social media, YouTube, man, be productive. Content create. See what it does for you. See if it builds your subscriber base. See if it builds you some revenue. Because obviously, you can make money on the internet. That's where the money is right now. So find your way. I mean, I am blessed, knock on wood, that I have podcasting to work off of. And that people definitely need marketing right now. So podcasting becomes a very important thing for me. And a video component is just me trying to get working somewhere. But honestly, if I was in Hollywood, I don't know what I could do with myself. But it's horrible. So the virus continues to force Hollywood to reckon with the theatrical windows. Um, theaters are shut, have shut down across the board, by the way. Most movie theaters are shut down now. That's it. So the current situation, NBC Universal, Sony Pictures are offering films on a pay-per-view basis. They're doing this, quote, out of complete distress and as some kind of unique new learning experience rather than a shift in strategy. Because right now they're offering some movies for $19.99. Now, I got to see movies last weekend. And honestly, I felt that I was going to not get another chance to watch movies for a while. So I took advantage. And maybe I didn't see the best movies in the world, but I saw Bloodshot and The Hunt. I went on a Friday night and a Sunday night. And I'll tell you what, I'm glad I did. Because then come Monday morning, or Tuesday morning, Regal Cinemas, which is where I go to and where I have my Regal Unlimited Pass, you've all known, they close the theaters down. AMC closed down. Most of the major th- chains have already closed their store, closed their doors for now because also they don't have movies to run. They don't have anything to work off of. So now, here's some of the movies that are coming out now that you can find out about. NBC Universal is making The Invisible Man, The Hunt, and Focus features Emma available. Also, the DreamWorks animation sequel, Trolls World Tour. The movies will be available for, available for a 48-hour rental period on all on-demand platforms for $19.99 in the U.S. and equivalent international market starting March 20th. So, Trolls will be the only film that has had no domestic theatrical run that will be offered as a pay-per-view offering. The original movie, $125 million budget, made $347 million worldwide. This budget was $90 billion, $90 million, excuse me, and the studio's locked into spending tens of millions of dollars on advertising. So the other films so far abbreviated runs in theaters, Invisible Man, $64 million. Emma, $9.9 million. Hunt, $5.3 million. And just the weekend, Bloodshot opened the theaters March 13th and estimated $9.3 million as the crisis advanced. Now, one of the people that talked about this here is Rich Greenfield. He 
He's a media analyst. And he mentions about the idea of the pay-per-view model. Here's the idea. So, let's say Universal thought Trolls would be a $600 million film. They could have made $260 million out of the theatrical window. At 20 bucks, they could sell 13 million copies. It's a big data point. They could learn a lot from doing Trolls. So, can it make the money they think? Well, and will people be willing to take that price point at $20 for a 48-hour window? We're not even going to own the movie yet. That's interesting. That's a pretty high steep price on my end myself. I don't think I would put my, I, I mean, for, for the experience of the movie theater, I'm already paying $12, $13 now, but I'm not paying it with a subscription. I think here, it's a harder sell. And when you're at home and you have so many other things to be watching, you can't recreate that theatrical experience like you do in the theater. I don't think, I don't know if this is going to work well, but I guess you could try. I think the price point's too much, but I see what they're trying to do. Again, it's the stress. Greenfield also says, no studio is likely to launch a movie with the potential to gross $1 billion on demand, even in the current crisis. So F9 pushed their movie into 2021. Some of the industry have speculated the studio might consider putting the film on its forthcoming Peacock streaming service to generate excitement, especially if the Olympics are postponed. Studio sources rule that out, especially as the Peacock service is not international and films derive a lot of revenue from China and Latin America. Minions, the still rise of Gru, would be another option for Peacock. It's set for July 4th weekend, but I believe I just saw that Atna is also suspended and postponed. The pay-per-view strategy makes the most sense for low-budget films or movies that didn't seem to likely to pull in still the box office numbers. Hunt and Bloodshot would be good opportunities. Yeah, they would. Now, the most successful pay-per-view event to date, Floyd Mayweather versus Manny Pacquiao in 2015, grossed $400 million in the U.S. That was a once-in-a-lifetime event where you didn't pay for the... You, you, if you didn't pay for it in the moment... It had no value. So the question is, is there urgency for a pay-per-view movie the way there is for a sporting event? The answer is probably not, end quote. Now, the other thing, theater owners are, are challenged because they feel like the premium value on the man offerings could be perceived by the public as a permanent change. And one, so one source says theater owners across the globe were angered when Universal announced the plans. A longtime studio exec says their anxiety is justified especially as a pay-per-view rental is probably cheaper for a couple than a night at the movies. For myself, it's different because I wouldn't pay that much for a movie on TV. I can't do it. I don't like it like that. The question is, will this shift another generation of people from 30 to 50? National Association of Theater Owners released a statement in defense of this model. They said, quote, People will return to movie theaters because that was that is who people are. When they return, they will discover a cutting-edge, immersive entertainment experience that they have been forcefully reminded they cannot replicate at home. End quote. And that's where I come from. I am not going to spend four or $5,000 in a home theater to create the same thing I could get when I could just go to the theater five minutes from my house, basically walk to it, and go there, enjoy popcorn, all the conveniences of not having to do all the stuff I need to do at home. I mean, it is true. They've also asked for good government relief so the industry and its tens of thousands of employees across the country can remain resilient. So as I said, domestic film exhibitor closures, AMC, Regal, Cinemark, Cineplex Entertainment, among the top ones that own over 350 to 630 theaters, and make up over 20,000 screens. They're all closed. They're all down. And that's where you are. They're all closed now. All of them. In China, they have some cinemas that have already reopened. Signs indicating that many more will open in the fall of their wake. It's amazing when you look at all the stories. 
And like I said, the kind of money that's being lost in all this is also very important. Let me get back real quick to the WG and AMPTP, which there was some news that broke earlier or, or broke a little bit later on as I was getting all this uh, information ready. Let's go and talk about that real quick. So everything is in flux right now, but a consensus is emerging that the March 23rd start on negotiations on a new te- film and TV contract will be pushed at least for a couple of weeks, according to Deadline.com. And whether that sees discussions over a new deal pause for the time being or the May 1st expiring current contract itself extended as the essentially shuttered industry continues to deal with the COVID-19 consequences is what Guild and producer, producer representatives are trying to figure out Thursday. As of this afternoon, as of this afternoon, as I record this Thursday, March 19th, there's been no official change in the announced plan of the two sides to meet the following week. Uh, that's where we are. Okay, now let's get back to the money that's being lost on all this. Because it continues to mount up. Now, a tally by S&P Global this week showed 107 companies across sectors put on negative credit watch or downgraded as the virus struck. 22 are from Media Entertainment. That's Endeavor, who owns the UFC, Live Nation, AMC Entertainment, Cinemark, Viacom, CBS, Parent, National Amusements, and Walt Disney. And that's where we are with things. Now, the USC is trying to go and survive. They're looking to relocate upcoming bouts to its Las Vegas Apex facility, which has full production capabilities that can broadcast fights and enable USC to receive media rights fees. Taking the WWE and AEW route, the wrestling route. <clears throat> and I don't think it loses much by solving the matches. <coughs> even if the crowds are there or not. I think that does help them out. So for them to try to do that, that's actually good. So as I said earlier, there is one shining light of all this. <clears throat> the TV ratings are going up. Amazing. People are rediscovering live linear viewing amid coronavirus and post stay at home. March 8th, the start of daylight savings time. The switch is usually associated with a live plus same days rating slump especially the APN hour, as people stay outside longer. But there's a turning point of the coronavirus outbreak in the U.S. And here's what's going on. Because of the new social distancing guidelines and spending more time at home, the slump was non-existent this year. Broadcast networks have been posting across the board week to week. Live and same-day rating increases, the likes of which we have not seen in ages. So this past Monday... NBC The Voice, up 38%. From 8.7 million viewers to 9.6 million viewers, the highest rated and most watched Monday or Tuesday edition of the singing competition in a year. Ellen's Game of Games, 8 p.m. program, up 44%. added 1.6 million viewers for its best marks in more than a year. This is up. This is us on NBC. Rose three-tenths in their demo. CBS's Bull and Bob Hart's Abishola posted season highs on Monday. But here's what's going on. So streaming had been tipped as a major beneficiary of the current mandate for staying home, but viewers... And many of them younger are also checking out traditional TV. Amazing. Nickelodeon's, porf- Nickelodeon's portfolio on the linear networks up 16% with kids 2 to 11 versus the prior four weeks. And ratings experts expect viewing levels growth to continue as more people stay home amid expanding restrictions, including quarantines around the country. Amazing. So keep that in mind, folks. There is still routes to continue to create content, which is the best part. This digital age has given us the opportunities to be really creative right now with what we can do with content. There is There are millions upon millions of people around the world looking to be entertained. And they cannot go to a theater or stage or a sporting, or a sporting arena or a concert hall. 
to get that. Now it's upon all of us as a community to be great content creators. And for those of you that have great stuff, do it. Because here's another thing I just saw now. Here's another story that came up. Netflix is going to limit streaming quality for European subscribers to preserve bandwidth during coronavirus. <laughs> How about that? For the next 30 days, they're going to limit the streaming quality. That's not good. I'm, only, uh, I'm really imagining what's going to be happening all together of what all that's going to be. But wow. There we go. Interesting story as well. I got to bring this up as well. Let me bring this up. Another story, U.S. box office wallop Wednesday with 5,000 liters dark, but some drive-ins still have some gas. Interesting. Who did the best, best business overall in the movie business? Largely drive-in theaters when juxtaposed to regular theaters. As long as local ordinances allow them to remain open, they're the best place for moviegoers to enjoy the show while practicing social distancing. But there won't be any new product for them for at least two months. And there are 305 drive-ins around the country. So the ones that made a lot of money, they list a lot of them, making between 600 or $500 and $1,200. How about that? At the moment, we're looking at the charts for this, this last run of movies before all the theaters closed. Onward, $10.6 million. Woo, Horrible. I still believe 9.1 9. million, 1.17, a second place for Bloodshot, Invisible Man, 5.89, Hunt, 5.3. And there you go. Not a lot of, mo- not a lot of money, money going on right now. Uh, other things going on in here, I noticed Ben Affleck, his movie The Way Back is going to head to homes as theaters close. So that movie, including Birds of Prey, will be made available at nineteen ninety nine. So again, we're going to keep an eye on what the pay-per-view business really does. If people are going to respond and do that, or are they just going to wait and say, you know what, we don't want to watch it when it's new. We'll wait for it to get on Netflix. Are people willing to go ahead and buy early to watch a movie? I don't think so either. I think the movie theater model will survive and sustain. I really do. I think so. Anyway, we're going to leave it there. Time for me to go ahead and get to the second part of my interview with writer turned filmmaker Brad Holloway, he wrote the he wrote and produced the movie Open House One Through Four, a short film. And at this point, we're going to talk about the labor situation. And of course, we don't know when that's going to be ending at any time soon. But it's interesting his take on just his perspective as a writer and a filmmaker about how his dealings have been with the unions because he is a Writers Guild member, which I ask him here, and we get some really in, good insight in this. So. Again, part two of my interview with Brad Holloway here on the Broadcasters Podcast. I want to move on to another subject here. I This is where, you know, looking out for screenwriters and looking out for those that are trying to get themselves ahead. When it comes to the overarching factors that are out there to try to go ahead and work in Hollywood and work through the obstacles of Hollywood. I want to talk about that real for you. Washington Post put up a headline, which I can't read thanks to their stupid paywall. Sorry, <laughs> fuck you, Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> writing that a woman has not seen a screenwriting Oscar since the George W. Bush administration. Activists call it a travesty. And that's all I got after I got sign up for $1.29 a month. Right. <laughs> so how do you view the push, you know, that's been out there for what's now the new term, the new hot term, DEI, diversity, equality, and inclusion. Do you think screenplay should be meritocracy based or should be more value on the story instead of the story writer? What do you think? Um, well, you know, I, I think, number one, people should be valued. I mean, well, I got to check carefully here. <laughs> you know, this well, is a very, you. Uh, yeah, time. yeah, you, yeah. you don't want to overstep your boundaries on this one. Like, you'll never well, work I mean, for yet. my own sake, I, uh, I prefer performance-based, but my thing is I absolutely agree that I want more, I want openness for stories to be diverse and to show. That's the thing, you know, is, that's the thing is, like, regardless of. I want the stories to be that. I mean, obviously you want to pick great writers, but you also yes. want different points of view. And, you know, a show like Atlanta, the Danny Glover show, you know, that show couldn't, um, that show couldn't be written uh, by a white guy, you know? And I think that's an all black writer's room. Uh, 
it's a, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a really, it's a good thing because you are, you're getting these stories that would never get, get told. I mean, it's tough for a guy like me. Um, for instance, I, I probably, all the entry level positions and, and writing staffs are usually reserved uh, for a diversity hire. Um, so if you're a white guy, you're, and you're just trying to get your foot in the door, you're, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, so I, don't well, know, is that I mean, fair? I want to think about that. When I want to think of the show writers that make great shows or make or great features. I think of, well, I mean, I think Ryan Murphy. I think Courtney Kemp, who uh, does the Star Series, who's now going to spread out and do the entire power, or the Star Series power, is going to do the entire chronology of the power universe, which I think is fantastic. Shonda yeah. Rhimes comes to mind. Um, and all of Lee Daniels with Empire. Yeah, Shonda think, Rhimes is the highest paid, uh, highest paid uh, writer in the world. Yeah, Literally, she I deserves think. it. She, she, gets, she has the biggest deal. They, they gave her, Netflix gave her a huge deal. <laughs> She's well, great. She, I mean, she's, she's she earned turns it. out hit. Um, I'll tell you, yeah, Scandal I mean, for the first three really four seasons, I was all in. <laughs> Scandal for the first yeah. couple of seasons was fantastic. And then it just it got, was. oh, how to go, yeah, how to go the, with Murder I was, was I also. Went on the, I was on the Scandal set. That was a, oh. it, was a, it was a good team also, people on there, yeah. Um, good cast. But, yeah, no, that show was that, I mean, it's a great premise, like a PR girl sleeping with the president. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's yeah. an, it's very juicy, very uh, soap opera, yeah. you know. But uh, no, that was that was that. Sh- no, I mean these different voices that we're getting in there. I, I do I do think it's really great, and the fact that we're, you know, we're really it's not just the same kind of old white guy perspective, you know, is good. Um, but I also I think that you know it, 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 sometimes you get I get a little worried just because you know I'm submitting it my my short film to all these festivals and um right when you're doing the submission it's like are you a guy you know they want to know your gender they want to know your race and they want to know your sexual orientation check all the boxes um, yeah and i'm yeah. just like well can't you guys just like watch the movie and see if you like like the movie <laughs> like why does it matter that if i'm like gay or something I, like i don't know why they need to know my sexual orientation to be able to judge whether or not uh, my films can be in their festival, <laughs> you know. I mean, I guess I would understand if it was like, I know, I think there are like cinema, like you know, where it's like, um, you know, there's a theme, and like maybe if you know, if it's a festival for black filmmakers or a festival for the LGBT community, then yes, I get it. But like, just a random festival in Spokane, Washington, why do I, why, why do they need to know my <laughs> sexual orientation? Um, but yeah, so you know what it's. It's a fine line. I think some of that is good, but I think if you take it to an extreme, then it's not good. And then, because there are going to be, there's going to be writers that don't get, the, you know, they can't move forward with their career and it's not, you know, it's not their fault. So there's always a room for progressive type storytelling. I, and there's a room for it. But when it's being pushed into the mainstream and people reject it, at some point, you know, yeah. the producers and people out there, look, I'm hearing right now about Doctor Who that people are rejecting the role right now that Jodie Wicker is playing of that role in that, in that show and the showrunner. Jody the show, a, a I actually iconic worked, series. She's, she's great. I actually worked with her on a movie called good. Um, oh. that starred Viggo Mortensen. She played Viggo Mortensen's love interest in that film. She's a great actress and a very nice human being. <laughs> um, so I'm all, I'm obviously rooting for her, but yeah, you know, you see it with like every, um, thing is, <laughs> Hollywood doesn't really want to make. They, they want the same I idea. I'm sure she's a wonderful actress, but I think she's. It's a challenge for her to be in that iconic yeah. role after all that legacy, and they're basically sure. writing the whole story. Sure. Gonna, yeah, yeah. You know, I've never actually. I don't. I. I'm, I'm not sure about Doctor Who because I've never watched it. I, I mean, I. Me I, I know it's an iconic series. I've only seen a couple like episodes. So, when I'm growing up. I don't even know. I don't know how. What your entry point is to get into that show? But I mean, I've been curious to watch it, but I never have. Um, but you know, like, look, not every action movie now needs to have a female lead, <laughs> um, which I think was the, the thing is Hollywood wants to make. They don't want to make new, exciting stuff necessarily. They want to make stuff that they know has made money in the past. <laughs> so they they have a formula, and they need to slightly alter that formula. But they they still want to follow the formula that made money in the past. So you have these sort of John Wick style action movies. But okay, no, instead of um, a white dude, we'll make it a girl. You know, and you have ten million projects. Rhythm method, 
you um, have. Well, so yeah, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, so a lot of these atomic blonde. Unfortunately, a lot of the yeah, a lot of the diversity stuff. What unfortunately they're making the same uh, same formulaic movies they made in the past, and maybe they're gonna mix up the diversity of the cast, which is good. But again, I mean, I'd rather just have new in whole new interesting ideas instead Absolutely. of just stuff kind of formulaic sort of stuff but, uh, well, put it like this there's a difference all right there's charlie's angels which they did the, the uh, formula again i watched it it was fine <laughs> i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say much more to that but now when i think of movies there are gonna be real a, a different feel to it i look at john david washington's tenet i'm like what the fuck what i want to see that that has me more yeah. interested than anything else right now. I'm like, there's nothing to it. It's so mysterious. And I'm like, uh, it's backwards, like going back in time, time machine type of stuff. Yeah. That's, yeah. Mm, I mean, I think that's going to be a sleeper hit in the summer. Yeah. Tenet, I, it, the trailer looks amazing. I yeah. mean, I don't know if, I don't know. I wouldn't know if it would be a sleeper hit. I think they spent 250 million on it. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, I don't it's know. Well, John David Washington, is he like a, is he like a box office commodity? Is that like the, a big bankable screen oh, star. Like, Denzel Washington's kid. You mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, Black Klansman was good. He was great in it. Yeah. I, I just don't know if he made it yet. To this is going to be carrying the series himself. No who, one, others, who else is the, in the, the, They're going to market the the film as a Chris Nolan movie. You know, right. that's how they market it because oh. he's. I mean, the, the the director of Inception and uh, that Dunkirk. You know, like uh, that's what yep. the marketing yep. will be. Uh, um, I don't so know. Makes again, sense. He's the biggest. He's he's probably the as far as directors making big budget original movies like he is, he's, he's the top, he's the top guy him, him or James Cameron, you know, but James Cameron has been off for 10 years making the, the next avatar. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there's only a handful of guys in the world who could get a, an, can get an original script like that greenlit. He's one of them. I'd say there's maybe five directors in the world that can get, that could get a $250 million original movie greenlit. Maybe five or ten. I think yeah. that, and and then I'm just I'm starting to think that maybe what John David Washington offers is he can become the next Denzel. He can be his daddy. I think that's right. what they want him to be. And I'm that's not I mean, a bad Denzel's place probably, to be. Probably Denzel may be my favorite actor. <laughs> he's um, great. I mean, oh, damn, he's everything he's in. Everything he's in, I gotta go watch. I haven't yeah. seen all. I mean, of it, I, like I said, Black Klansman was fine, but I haven't seen that that actor. I haven't seen him rise to the level of his father, but I mean, he's still a young guy, you know? I mean, and he's obviously, I mean, the, the trailer for Tenet looks great. I have no idea what the movie's about. Oh, but he also I mean, just it. finished Ballers, uh, the, the HBO series. So now, as you off of that, yeah. now he's going to have time to go and goof, go full movie roles. And, you know, let's just see what he picks. But I'm, yeah. you, know, you know what? Yeah, I he's, was good, to yeah, say, he, he's good okay. on Ballers, too, but he's just not my... It's just hard not to think of Denzel when you're watching him, <laughs> which is not fair to that guy. Cause, but he know, also sounds like his father, here. like a lot like he his does. Dad. Yeah. He sounds a lot like his dad. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. like if I'll tell you what, if they had to like, OK, the bad boys, <laughs> the universe came back, which I was amazed it came back like it did. I could see him being like if they wanted to like, you know, do like a like a post course like that and have yeah. where like, you know. Uh, to well, you know, and of, of, his characters go yeah. forward, and then John yeah. Washington is brought into the mix. I can see that. Yeah, I mean, instead of Gemini Man being Will Smith, you know, with that de aging, weird de aging technology, you know they what? could have just turned yes, the Denzel and his kid, right? You know, <laughs> yes. Damn that! No, they should have written that. Yeah, because you know, uh, Gemini Man, I just I thought it was. Uh, don't get me wrong, Will Smith, he's great in so much, but. It was, I felt like it was miscast. It was the wrong person for the role. And, you know. Well, that Gemini Man was a horrible development process. I think it took them like 10 or 12 years to make that movie. Yeah. Um, and they went through like a million different uh, directors. I think when Will Smith was attached to do that movie, uh, he was he was one of the biggest guys, biggest actors in the world. And then he sort of had a couple of stumbles. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Gemini Man kind of bombed, but then Bad Boys Three made a ton of money and got great reviews. So he's he's back on the he's back, back on the horse. That's yeah, the best <laughs> best best showing since Concussion, which I thought he was great in. And yeah, Concussion. He was good in Concussion. Yes. I remember they thought he would get he would get some Academy consideration. And I never thought so too. Seem to, he should have. Yeah, should have been nominated. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Absolutely. All right. Yep. I'm gonna hit something now. If you thought the DEI question was tough, Brad. 
wait till I hit you with these haymakers, okay? Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, <look. laughs> we're going to talk, talk about the labor unions. And, you know, I'm the, one of the only shows that probably talks about this at all. But I'm going to keep it as easy as I can for you. I don't want you to step on sure. any toes. We're, we're not crossing picket lines, okay? We're not doing that, okay? All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the ongoing labor issues going on in Hollywood. The latest news I have now is the Association of Talent Agents and the Writers Guild of America. Are you a Writers Guild uh, member? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, so they've been at odds since last April. I've been talking about this since December 2018. I told you how far back I can do Because I knew when, when it was coming up in April last year, this was going to come th- to fruition, and then everybody else was going to have to like deal with this because it would just be a domino effect. So now, right. the deal is the artist manager basic agreement, which has not been re- renegotiated since 1976. I want to just get to the basics here and ask you. So now, the two issues under contention are the fees associated with packaging and the rising trend mm-hmm. of agencies working with affiliated producers owned by their parent companies. The guild's desired changes to those practices would dramatically affect how Hollywood agencies do business. So I want to understand what it is that is the contention that you're seeing about this and what you've had to do with, sure. with packaging and being put into as a full package for a project. Well, packaging just basically means that um, the agency puts all the pieces of the project together. So they go out and they get the writer and then they have a, they get the showrunner, they get the director, they get the stars, you know, they create a package. And then in return for doing, for using that package, they get a percentage of the show's budget in essence. Um, And so the problem is that if I'm repped, if I'm a writer and I'm uh, staffed on a show and my agency, CAA, say I'm in a CAA and they own and they get a percentage uh, of the budget um, or the, sorry, if, if they make money, if, essentially they, they, they're partial owners of the show. And so they're, it's, they're not incentivized to, ne- to negotiate hard uh, for their clients because they own, because they're essentially, they're also, they're, they're, they're also, their client's boss on some level. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a little complicated uh, to make sense of it, but basically they're incentivized to keep the budget of the showdown lower so that they can get more money from it. Um, and so it's counterintuitive to the writers to, to have, it's the same thing if the agencies are, are going, are becoming production companies. Um, I was with UTA. They started a production company. I was also a CAA at one point. They started a production company. And so, yeah. Again, like there, you can't. Your your agent is supposed to be in there and doing these tough negotiations to get you more money. But if your agent is your boss, if they're the owner, then they're not, obviously they're not going to pay you very well. Um, and so that's really what the the guild is trying to accomplish: is they don't want the packaging anymore. They don't want um, the studio. They don't want the agencies to become studios. They just want the agencies to make the money the way they should, which is by getting 10% of whatever they get their clients. Therefore they're incentivized to negotiate hard. Um, I think you, the people like Michael Ovitz are probably most responsible for really, you know, uh, glor- glamorizing the idea of the packaging because CAA from yeah. what I read of his, of his memoirs was absolutely that. And I mean, I see the reason why they did it. But again, it is where, you know, it, it, times have well, changed. Actually, we, we talked about David Simon earlier. It was really, yeah. he's one of the guys who really spearheaded this whole thing about, you know, just how wrong packaging is. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it gets a little complex and they, they want it to be complex because they don't want people to, they, they don't necessarily want people to understand it. The writers to understand exactly what's going on. Uh-huh. Uh, but, but yeah, essentially they're, yeah, it's, it's the, the managers, I, I, I had an agent, uh, but we had to basically almost all the agencies didn't want to sign off on the uh, to end packaging, but a couple have signed agreements with the guild. Um, I don't actually know who they are. I have a manager and a lawyer and it's enough, you know, <laughs> I'm already giving away 15% before, no, before I had a, you know, you know, even if you, it's, it's funny because even if you, you know, say you sell a script for 150 grand, that sounds like an enormous amount of money. But, uh, when you yeah. give your manager 10% and your agent 10% mm-hmm. and your, uh, your lawyer 5%, you pay your taxes, uh, you give your writers, your guild fees, I mean the money and it t- and then you got to do 40 rewrites. <laughs> you know? oh, uh, so it's, it's big numbers become much smaller after you pay, give everybody their piece of the pie, you know? 
I, I would love a world where you just had a lawyer and you just had five percent. You know, but I don't. Yeah. But I don't know. Well, it's probably not going to happen. Industries. I mean, songwriters. I can imagine the same kind of uh, aspect with that too. And it's also where you know this is why you look at yourself. And you say, well, look at all I have to go and pay for. But like, let me get myself more entrenched into the process, which is what you did with the record. Yeah. Now, I want to move along and yeah, ask you about this. Exactly. Now. It's okay. Uh-huh. The Writers Guild and the Association of Movie Motion Picture Television Motion Picture and Television Producers. They're finally heading the t- to the table to iron out a new agreement. And the board of the Directors Guild of America have unanimously recommended to its members a tentative agreement with the AMPTP. So we're seeing some movement right now. Netflix has done some deals with the writers, and obviously the Writers Guild has made a process so that you can submit scripts online and there is nothing yeah. that's kind of holding you back or protruding you from going to studios or uh, to networks to go ahead and see if you can get a script that can be green lighted and piloted. So I want to just know, you know, when this is all resolved, whether it's in the next year or so, because also the Screen Actors Guild has to worry about the script. SAG after is coming up in the play. So all this is coming up after this is all said and done without having to determine how it's going to turn out. What do you think will become the new pipeline for screenplay submissions after everything's resolved? Do you think packaging would just get dismissed? The code of conduct is signed. Do we move along? Do you think that would actually happen from what you're learning about? You know, I, I, I really, I'm not, when, after I moved to Florida, I stopped getting, following that stuff super closely. Right, uh, right. <laughs> honestly, cause that's kind of why I didn't want to be around it. Oh, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, but no, I mean, I, I think that, look, there's got to be some sort of people that, the most screenplays, this is going to make me sound kind of like a jerk, but most most screenplays, the vast majority of screenplays, 99% of them are terrible. Mm-hmm. So there's got to be some way that you screen out the good ones from the bad. Yeah. So there's always going to be a need for people like agents to, to suss through all this material and find, you know, the decent stuff when it's the piles of trash, you know, I mean, there's a lot of really bad screenplays. So some sort of submission system where people are just randomly submitting screenplays. I don't know, you know, there's got to be people that are arbiters of, of taste and they can help shepherd through the good stuff. But is uh, it basically safe to say that what we really want after all said and done, the purpose of all this right now is because of the, the digital disruption is the fact that we need to now incorporate what's happening with the streamers and being able to make sure that you are as a screenwriter or as a director or as a producer that you're getting properly compensated and getting your piece out of yeah. that money. Well, that's why we had the strike. We went on strike right when I first got in the, in the writer's bill, we went on strike. Mm-hmm. This is probably 12, maybe 12 years ago, 11 or 12 uh, years seven, ago. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, yeah, 2007, and that was because, um, yeah, no, I mean, I literally, I, I became a full-time writer, and then, like, a week later, we were on strike. Wow. Yeah, um, that was my introduction into the, in the industry, but, um, no, I think that was, that was over our getting writers a certain percentage of streaming uh, income, you know, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's hard, I mean, uh, there's never been more content before, but I think there's also never been as much theft of content as there is right now, as far as it's, there's a million sites where you can go just pirate stuff. Um, I forget how many times Game of Thrones was pirated, but it was like millions and millions and millions of yeah. times, you know, and that's money out of people's pocket. Um, the right <clears throat> in the studio, but so yeah, streaming is definitely, um, definitely disrupting stuff. I don't know how much streaming has to do with this particular point of contention. Now the packaging, um, because that packaging, like you said, I think it was Ovis who started it, but I think it's packaging. It's been around for a long time. It was around in the business when I first got started. Right. But the thing was that um, when it was packaging before, before Ovis, like his idea was, well, let's just not make the movie star, the movie star. Let's create the brand that creates other things around the movie star. Right. Yeah. And that's what yeah, he man, did. And I, 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 I look. I think the guy had brass balls. That guy was. Uh, I mean, the way he was able to push people around like he did, I thought it was amazing. I don't know how much of it was true because it was his book, but I got to think the guy was behind a lot of different projects that did very well. And I was amazed how he was able to do so much like he did. And that the agency oh, yeah, still he's one of, strong he was as one of the though. biggest. Yeah, no, I mean he's he's uh, he's an icon. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then. Uh, Scorched Earth sort of tactics, you know. Absolutely. But, you know, I like those kind of guys. I like that. 
<laughs> I'm, I, I can't just sit around and just pussyfoot. I have to like, you know, yeah. let's get stuff done. All right. Yeah. Now, no, I, I mean, I worked it, I worked it the way I, my first job in Los Angeles, I was an assistant at UTA. That's actually how I got repped is I was an assistant, which is basically a secretary for an agent. Yeah. And so I've seen the inner workings of the, of the, of the agencies and, uh, and, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with the, the culture of, of agents and it's very it is very much take no prisoners <laughs> um, well let me ask you and they'll drop, yeah. did you ever yep. consider the agency route for yourself since you were already well entrenched no no you can't be an agent and a writer no uh, but did you ever think that maybe I know how good scripts are written I should be the one greenlighting them well the, the oh you yeah. mean yeah I mean I would I would love to be production capacity and get together a financing fund. That would be great. Yeah. I would love to do that at some point. Um, you know, I, I never really had much of an interest in being an agent because right. Well, you know, right when I first got in the industry, I mean, I was a journalism major coming out of college and then I became an assistant. And before I got to Hollywood, I just assumed that there was a million amazing, amazing scripts. And, um, and then when I actually got into to Hollywood and I started reading the screenplays, stuff that was selling even and it just wasn't good that's what i said wait i can write something this guy <laughs> so yeah. I like no, um, and that, that, but yeah oh i was gonna say then with all your experience now that you have you've produced you've directed you've written you've worked on the agencies you have a lot of background in hollywood and these days there's a lot of grassroots houses that are just doing their own projects independent because they don't need to probably have the old guard of having yeah. all these different things yeah. plus you have management you have agency uh, representation yeah. Well, right now I'm in the process own. of yeah I'm in the process of raising um, money to do a feature right now that I would be producing and directing. I already wrote the script go. and I have and I have a sales reel and everything. Yeah, I think the budget is the line budget came in at 1.5 million. Um, oh, so I am man. trying to do yeah. So I am trying, which is very 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 reasonable for a for a film for a feature length film. It's about as cheap as you're going to get. <laughs> Hey, man, if there's a way for you to get it done, trust me, come back to the show and let us know what's comes about. Because I'd love to go ahead and hear the story and see if you get if you can get the funds. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a combination of um, I'm putting together the package, essentially the sales package. But I'm going to go to some financiers and that I you know have connections with in L.A. And then also there's some people in Naples I'm going to talk to just because it is one of the wealthiest um, towns in the country. I think it's in the top 10, you know, and there's a lot of high net worth individuals and yeah. a lot of the financing for these films when you really get down to it, it's just uh, wealthy individuals that want to invest and want like, you know, like the arts and want to support the artists. And I don't know, we'll see. I mean, I think with the short film catching on with that starting to sort of generate a cult following, I think that'll be helpful too, which is another re reason that I made the short was to show that I could do this so that I can then go off and, you know, start baking my scripts, my feature link go. stuff. So again, so, uh, the, feature yeah. film, the, the short film is open house one to four. Uh, I want to go ahead and uh, again, soon to Amazon open Prime house, video. The, if, yeah. If you go on open house, the film.com, you can, you can watch the trailer. Um, and then the short should be, if hopefully Amazon gets over whatever their technical difficulties are, but it should be up on Amazon here any day now, any time. Yeah, by the time um, everybody hears this, they should be able to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah I want to so, ask yeah. what your other projects you have going on, just so uh, kind of give people the, the mood and the things. You have the games of 1940, which is with RT Features, the same people that have created at yeah. Astra and Call Me Your Name, which was based yes, on the original idea by David Seidler, who was best Oscar winner for best original screenplay for the King's Speech, which was a fantastic movie. Yeah, uh, yeah, they wrote it as a feature. Oh, yeah, they wrote that one as a feature, and then um, they decided they wanted to make it into a t into a limited series, so uh, an eight hour series. So they had me write the first of first hour. So yeah, so they were trying actively trying to find a home for that project now. Or they might actually be trying looking for directors. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, that one's an active development still. And then you also have Conception, which is the one with producer Dylan Russell, director Fulvio Sestito, uh, yeah. Swine with producer Nikki Stranghetti, and Carnival with Robert Lawrence, who is best known for the King Killer Chronicle, which yeah. was starting uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda of uh, Hamilton yeah. fame, Clueless, Die Hard with a Vengeance as well. Um, so, you know, where do you see, uh, what do you think is the next project that you think you're going to have to be? probably have to be rewriting because you know it's got, about to get ready to get uh, big time into, into production. 
Well, we had Carnival. Out. We had uh, Kelsey Grammer was going to play the lead role. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, speaking of like the sort of the diversity thing, um, it was it's about a PR guy who goes to this tropical island. There's a Car- in the Caribbean. There's a Caribbean old school dictator, and the old school dictator. The oh. island has been under sanctions for 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 thirty years, and this dictator basically decides he he wants to get the sanctions lifted, and he brings this PR guy, this New York PR guy, Ooh. down to help him get the sanctions lifted. And so uh, is, that the, is the dictator very Castro be, influenced? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. It's, it's another dark comedy. Yeah. But they were going to have Kelsey play it. Yeah, they were going to. Kelsey was going to play the lead, but now I guess there were concerns. Um, you know, something about, you know, a white guy showing up to help uh, people of color and oh. maybe that's not going to You know, Kelsey Grimm was, also, I think, was an underrated, bowl, uh, underrated uh, role in the show Boss on Stars. I actually really enjoyed him in that show. Yeah, he is, the thing about Kelsey is he has a tremendous range. So he um, yeah. he's, a, he's a great, he's, he's great comedic timing, but he can also have bring the gravitas. Because uh, well, it was a dramatic be actor, such a piece of Absolutely. shit in that show, man. Yeah, yeah, no, he, yeah, he's a he's a, a, an awesome guy in real life too. Very yeah. laid back, cool guy. So fantastic. All right, well, yeah, anyway, he was actually uh, born in he was born in the Caribbean, actually. So interesting. Kind of has a personal that. personal connection. Brad Hollyway. Yeah. Now, is there a website where you can follow all of your projects? Um, not really. I kind of been your a lot of that stuff. They don't really want you to publicize unless okay. it goes into production. So you got to kind of play it out. Be a well, I don't know if there's the anything where your bio or like, is there any, any any social media we could follow you on? If you go on Open House the film, uh-huh. it has a full bio for me on there. I kind of have cool. all my director's stuff on there. Yeah, excellent. All right, Open yeah. House the film dot com. Brad Hollywood, uh, yes, Best of luck with Open House One to Four and uh, all those other features, man. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for making time, and uh, hope to uh, catch you down the line. Thanks for being on the broadcasters podcast. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. That's going to do it for me. Thank you all for listening to the program and listening as you always do. Very thankful for all of you to be on listening to this show. Interesting. A lot to talk about. And, you know, I'm really amazed on how this is all working out for everybody. And I'm really, uh, I pray for everybody out there to be safe, safe and sound, happy and healthy. Hunker down, please. And for all of you, again, this is where I'm so most important talking about content is king and the cold control of your content really more than ever is in your hands thank you for listening to the broadcasters podcast presented by broadcasterspodcast.com and kingofpodcasts.com the broadcasters podcast is brought to you by kingofpodcasts.com slash amazon if amazon is good enough for the king of podcasts it most certainly is good for you kingofpodcasts.com slash Amazon. And don't forget to check out the King of Podcasts wrestling program. The Wrestling is Real podcast exclusively at kingofpodcasts.com.